Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Consul, your host. In addition to being the host of this podcast and interviewing novelists, I am a novelist myself. I have three published novels. My latest is titled Lolita Firestone, a supernatural novel, and it is set in Sedona, Arizona and Cairo, Egypt. My previous novel is titled Family Recipes, a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. And my first novel is named Hardwood, a novel about college basketball and other games young men play. And that story deals with issues ranging from depression and racism to sex, religion, and university politics. All three novels are listed in the episode notes. I hope you will buy them, I hope you will read them, and I hope you will thoroughly enjoy them. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight, one of my favorite authors, uh, a guy who I really only discovered, I mean, I knew of him for many years, but I really only started reading him uh, in in the last few years. I have a good friend whose uh, uh, opinion I trust, and I ask him, who's your favorite novelist? And he said, without hesitation, T.C. Boyle. He said, read The Tortilla Curtain. That was my first exposure to T.C. Boyle, and I've been reading him ever since. I just finished Blue Skies, which is his latest. Um, and and T.C. Boyle is the man in the spotlight, obviously. He's the author of more than 30 books, uh, 30 books of fiction, about 21 novels, 10 short story collections. Uh, and again, including his most recent is Blue Skies. I just finished reading that one. Other titles include uh, The Harder They Come, uh, the, the, the Terranauts. The Relive Box, which I'm reading right now, my first short story collection I'm reading by by T.C. Boyle, uh, outstanding. If you do nothing else, do yourself a favor and read Are We Not Men, that short story alone, if you, if if nothing else. I'm only about halfway through that book right now. I'm going to be re- reading a lot more T.C. Boyle to come. Uh, Outside Looking In is another one. Talk to Me. I Walk Between the Raindrops. It's, it's, an, extensive, uh, it's an extensive collection of work. And uh, which is what's impressive about it is the volume of books produced and the quality of the books produced. This guy's a jazz player. He doesn't do outlines, these strict outlines. What he does is he uh, creates things organically. He's not uh, Kenny G. He's he's uh, John Coltrane or Miles Davis. There, he extemporizes. He improvises. And uh, I tried doing that once in my life and I wrote myself into a corner, well, twice in my life. I tried two different times and I decided I, I need to work with an outline for whatever reason he's able to do it. He's got his PhD from uh, University of Iowa. The degree is in 19th century British literature. Got his bachelor's before that in English and history from SUNY Potsdam at State University of New York at Potsdam. Why Potsdam? Well, one of the reasons may be that it was close by. Uh, Tom was raised in uh, Peekskill, New York, not far from where, where I was raised in Endicott, New York. So we have that in common. Tom also played baseball as a kid. I did too, although basketball was more my sport than baseball. I struck out a lot. I uh, was a pretty good fielder though. And uh, so as I say, he hails from Peekskill, New York, and uh, he, he had been for many years a member of the English department at University of Southern California starting in 1978. He was a distinguished professor of, of, uh, of English. Um, and, you know, I just found out that he's uh, hung up his cleats. He's no longer teaching at USC. He's done, did it for a long time. And now he's a full, now he's sticking with his evening job, which is, is really his day job too. And that's as a novelist and short story writer. His work has been translated into more than two dozen foreign languages. And his stories have appeared in uh, most of the, most notable major magazines such as the New Yorker, Harper's, Esquire, the Atlantic Monthly, Playboy, uh, the Paris Review, Gentleman's Quarterly, uh, and so on. So getting back kind of that theme uh, theme I was hitting earlier, let's face it, most novels are very quotidian. Uh, they're they're all plot, no no sizzle. Um, that, that's not, that's not the TC Boyle way. As I say, his stuff is free form. It's unencumbered. It's electric. It's irreverent. Uh, those of you who've li- who listen to the podcast know that I don't flatter my guests. Uh, this, this, I guess is an exception because I am a big fan uh, of Tom's. Um, and, and I mentioned he's kind of the fiction writing equivalent of a jazz saxophonist, uh, you know, bobbing, weaving, um, and, uh, he hits some line drives. He hit some Texas League uh, singles, 
getting back to the baseball theme there. And uh, he listens to music while writing, something a lot of people do and a lot of people don't do. I think jazz and uh, and uh, um, classical music are probably his two favorites, just in terms of laying down prose. But uh, uh, enough for me, Tom uh, T.C. Boyle. Welcome to the program. Hello, Mike. Thank you. I loved your introduction. I could listen to you. Tell me how wonderful I am all day long. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it jazz is it is it jazz and classic you listen to and at what volume how many decibels yes i'm listening to jazz and classical when i'm writing uh otherwise i'm a rock and roller so when i'm relaxing i'm listening to rock and roll but i find it too distracting while writing what i need is the rhythm and the beauty in the background i don't want it to overwhelm me and what is the volume? I don't know. Probably a tolerable volume. When I was a much younger guy and my office was the bedroom and the little children were little children, uh, the volume was considerably higher. <laughs> <laughs> now that, uh, you know, you mentioned rhythm and that's one of the things a lot of people I think don't understand about writing that writing is so much about, I think everything in life is basically about rhythm. The universe is a rhythmic thing. Um, and we have circadian rhythms and so on. And uh, I remember there's an instructor from Iowa who did a great uh, great courses lecture on how to improve your sentences. And his uh, baseline advice was, um, and this gets back to rhythm, his baseline advice was, you can improve your writing instantly by writing longer sentences. Don't listen to these people who say, write short, short sentences. Mm. He says cumulative sentences that are very easy to understand. They're long, but they're very easy to understand because they're like cumulative this. in nature. I Do you like know what this. I'm saying? Yeah, I yeah, think we, you probably had him told, as a professor. We told that to, to James Joyce, actually. I wonder if he understood that. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> there, are, there are different rhythms. And yes, I normally have a longer line. But also sometimes then you punch in short lines in this kind of staccato rhythm. Uh, it Precisely. all just depends on how it's going. Now you mentioned SUNY Potsdam. I went there to be a, a musician. That's the New York State Music College. I played saxophone as a kid and I could play it on my head. I could stand on my head. I could sight transpose. I could play anything. Unfortunately, I didn't play the kind of music that they expected us to play, which was classical. I had no knowledge of it and I flunked my audition. But since I was there in uh, as an undergraduate, I chose a history major. And uh, in the second year we got into a class and I discovered Flannery O'Connor. I said, okay, I'll be a double major, history and English. And in my third year, I wound up in a creative writing classroom, which is why I did teach undergrads for such, and grads for such a long time. Uh, to me, it's a miracle to have a liberal arts education to kind of figure out who you are and what you are. Now, what, uh, uh, how did you actually take that writing class because you thought you might like writing or was it just an elective that you thought, let's see what, what's going on here? By then, it just would be my third year. You know, I, I was not a great student in that I was really a punk and wasn't doing what I was supposed to do and never have actually. <laughs> uh, but I was getting a lot of praise from the professors for the papers I was writing. And they began to give me an idea that maybe I'm a writer. And so then I graduated to writing my own fiction. So you uh, is it is is writing a habit, a passion, an obsession or an addiction for you? Well, it's 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 all of those things. Uh, it's also suicide prevention. <laughs> Are you and you and uh uh, Stephen King, both. Yeah. I think for a lot of people, it's suicide prevention. Now, you had fun with drugs back in the day. I, I had heard somebody say you were you're a musician and a junkie, but you were never actually a junkie, right? You never got really addicted. You just had fun I with I just them. had fun with, with heroin and all the other drugs you could possibly mention. Uh, but the fun gets limited when you get into your uh, 20s and you're 23 or four and every night you're at the same club with the same deadhead sitting at the bar. And a little glimmer went off of my brain thinking, uh, well, there's got to be something more than this. And of course, I had advantage over many of them. I knew how to read <laughs> and I was obsessed <laughs> with reading and then I knew how to write. And so once I discovered what I wanted to do and went to Iowa to the writer's workshop. That was it. I mean, I didn't, I was completely clean, uh, gave everything up, but it was a demarcation in my life. 
And now I was serious. Now I was a PhD student and I was an MFA student. And now I was going to produce my life's work. Uh, it's also known as growing up. You know, I think I just grew up a little bit. Right, right. Well, you know, people who use drugs for uh, mind expansion, let's say, or even recreation, they say, you know, in the beginning, it's 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 great, but then it never it's never the same after the first few times. And even with mind expansion, people who are looking to to see God or to break through to the metaphysical, um, it's kind of like you know, it took me where it could take me, and and you know, it, it's all going to be downhill from here. This is why so. I wrote Outside Look Again three books ago. It's a novel set in uh, the period of the uh, late 50s, early 60s, when people were beginning to experiment with LSD. And uh, one of the characters in the novel is is Timothy Leary. And um, the proposition is, he's a graduate student, and he's in psychology, and he happens to take Leary's class. And Leary had a cult. If you didn't take LSD, you couldn't work with him. You couldn't, you were, you were not in the in-group. I thought, how curious, you know, in terms of academia, because my mentor at, at Potsdam, Frederick P.W. McDowell, uh, wanted me to do one thing only, and that is read and love literature. Uh, there was no compulsion to do anything else, but with, with Leary, his students had to trip and be part of this cult. Yeah, he kind of ruined it for everybody. The people who are experimenting with it at the time, I mean, this the parapsychologist and all said, well, you shut your mouth, you're drawing too much attention to this, you're going to get a banned." And sure enough, that's what happened. Because uh, he he uh, turned he had the Johnny Appleseed approach to it, which was not, not good. Um, you know, I was going to mention the guy at that professor I was talking about earlier at Iowa said, if I'm on the dance floor, you'll notice right away, I have two left feet, but you, you give me a piece of writing and I can I can see rhythm like nobody's business. So there are a lot of different kinds of, some people recognize rhythm here. Some people can actually uh, um, demonstrate it and so on. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, what about reading aloud? One of the, my joys, you know, I fronted a little rock band for a while years ago and uh, love, love an audience. But one of my great joys today is to be the actor of my own work, to be on stage and give a reading. So, for instance, uh, coming up, I'll be going to the, uh, the Tucson Book Fair, where I've been many times, and I'll do a solo show, but then I'll do a panel and talk with other writers, which is all right. I mean, I don't mind talking about literature, as we're doing now, but I much more prefer doing it. So I love to be the actor and present the audience a short story in a dramatic form. I'm the actor. I'm the guy. Shut the lights out. We're going to have a show here, because that's what literature is at heart. Yes, we want to uh, take it apart and study it and interpret it. That's great. But really, what it's about is like a piece of music. It, it has to grab you in its moment. That's what it is. So I'd love to do this. And um, yeah, when I'm writing a, a book, as I am now, I'll read to my wife when I'm done for the day. Uh, not so she'll criticize or critique it, but just so I can hear how it sounds out loud, which is totally different from reading it on the screen. What do you sometimes hear when you're reading aloud that you turn around and decide, I, I need to eradicate that? Nothing, never, that's never happened. I'm hearing it, but what is good is it lights up another part of my brain so that when I'm looking at the page and making discoveries and I'm in the moment and I'm you know unconscious, that's great, that's one way of doing it. But when I'm reading it to her, when I've written today and performing it and hearing it, it enables me somehow to make little leaps of intuition as to where it's going and, you know, architecturally and what might come and what it is and what does it mean and everything else. Somehow in the act of reading it aloud, I'm able to do that. And I'm able to do it too, as you are when you're reading the manuscript, but it's slightly different. And again, I really have to hear the rhythm and the beat of it. And yet again, this is another reason why I love to perform aloud for an audience. And I love to hear other authors read their work, even if they're not a great reader. You just want to hear their voice and hear their intonation, hear their emphases, and hear their rhythm. I'm glad you mentioned that because you read I, the audio version of, of The Relive Box. 
And, um, you know, I read all day long for my job. Uh, people who listen to the podcast, they know I've said this before. In the evening, I open the ears up. I like audiobooks in the evening. So my, my eyes are fairly burned out by then. And I love to hear an author read, even if they're not a good reader. You're a good reader. Paul Oster, for instance, I don't think he's a particularly good reader, but I still love to hear him read his stuff. The thing about listening to you read is that you put all the emphasis and the inflection, whatever, exactly where you knew you wanted it. So um, I, I was really happy to, to to have you read it. You don't read all your own stuff, but uh, you did. You do read that one. I did have read, read a lot, and, and mainly the books of stories in recent years. But previously, I would I would do the novels as well. The problem is. Um, it takes fierce concentration and takes a long time in the studio. So I've in recent years, I've confined it to the books of stories. Um, uh, for example, uh, probably the one that you're reading, the real the box. box. Yeah. box. So uh, there's a studio in town here. I know the guy. Great. He's, he's a rock and roll guy. He's got a little studio and he'll, he'll do the books with me. Uh, he's, it's his studio and we've done a thousand things there together including all these radio shows and the new yorker and all of that we record there so it's very very comfortable the last time i went in uh we're gonna do, we're gonna do this book in three days three days period that's what we're gonna do the first day you know i'm going along okay but then around lunchtime your stomach starts to rumble peristalsis is happening you're not even aware of it but it's <laughs> it, it, it the mics are so sensitive sensitive it picks it up so we had to take a break for lunch. I made the huge mistake of actually eating lunch because when we get back to the studio at one o'clock, you know, I hear I'm it. <laughs> food and I'm you know, fumbling over my words and, and so on. So the next day I realized no lunch. I went out, took a break. I went to the corner store, got a Diet Coke, a bag of peanut M&Ms, walked around the block, came back and nailed it. There you go. There <laughs> you, you go. Focus. It's, it, you need tremendous focus. And again, if you're performing live, well, so you flub something, it doesn't really matter. But in the studio, it's got to be perfect. And so you pop a P or whatever it's going to be, and they'll stop you. And you do it again and again, and you just kind of lose focus. Now, should you, should you write short stories as well as novels. And uh, do you write short stories because you've got more ideas than you can possibly uh, turn into novels? Is that one of the uh, motivations for short stories? What is, cause there are some people who think that's your, that's your form, that, that, that you're even better with the short stories than the novels. Um, what, what do you say as to your motivation for writing short stories? To me, it's all a story, whether it's five pages long or 50 or 500, it's just a story, but some stories just seem to need a larger scope than others. And I, I like what you said at the outset there, uh, Mike, because yeah, there are too many things that I can't write a novel about everything. Like you talked about, Are We Not Men? Okay, so especially when I'm in a story writing period, all the things that have been bugging me or interesting me in the period when I'm locked into a novel, well, now it's time to address those. And for instance, with Are We Not Men, for those who don't know, this I wrote a few years ago about CRISPR technology, CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which allows us to much more easily and quickly combine genes in the lab. I just wondered, well, where does that go? What does that mean? Where does that leave us as human beings? And so the stories are meditations on that. Uh, as you said at the outset, I just have a kind of idea. I do my research and now the story starts to talk to me and I just want to see where it's going to go. That that, it, that was really interesting. I, I was surprised that you that you had gone with the CRISPR technology and all that, but it was fantastic. That that's something that I'm familiar with myself. Um, let me ask you. You mentioned, yeah, as a young person, you had fun with drugs. Then you grow up, but we become children again when we get older. So, and and now you're kind of semi-retired. You retired from teaching. So wait, 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 do wait, you wait, wait, wait. I don't like this term retired. I prefer pre-dead. Pre-dead. Yeah. Pre, -dead. Pre dead, let the countdown begin. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> play out the so, spring, man. No, no, I mean I've always I've been lucky with teaching in that I, I they never wanted me. I started the writing program at USC. They never wanted me to teach in my specialty, which I probably couldn't do unless I went back to school again. So I only was teaching 
uh, the creative writing and the students stimulated the hell out of me because what am I doing two days a week? I'm, I'm discussing with really smart people what I love best. So all that was was really good for me. So it fired your writing. I've heard I've heard novelists who said I was you know reading these dreadfully written papers all week and it dragged me down. It, you, that was not your experience at all. You had I smart corrected, students and they got you jazzed up. As a copy editor, I corrected every line of everything they wrote. I read thousands of pages. Some was not so good. Some was good. Uh, it's not so much that. It's just seeing the love of the art form that I have so much and being able to discuss it in its minutiae with a given manuscript. True or false, you cannot teach writing. No, you can't teach someone to be a great writer who doesn't have an innate gift. The same with music, same with being a baseball player, which you mentioned earlier. However, what you can do is guide them to make insights about their own life and their own work. And some will, some have an enormous, enormous gift. I mean, I always was always surprised at how big that gift is in our society and whether it's going to be pursued or not. I don't know. And some of the students do pursue it and that's great. But as far as their education, as liberal arts students is concerned, as I said earlier, it opens up the world to them. And, and, and as literature students too, yeah, okay, we read Thomas Hardy's novels and we discuss them. Uh, and we see the interconnections between them and we see the themes and so on. But if you're doing a nuts and bolts kind of thing of dissecting a given manuscript, uh, it really, I think, gives you a sense of what literature is and how it's made. Now that you're in your pre-dead state and you don't have to teach a SC anymore, um, so a very adult job that you have set to the side now. Uh, do you experiment being that you're, you're kind of a kid again, in a sense, as we get older, we become kids again, and we, we start to open our minds up a little bit more. We're a little freer. Do you ever use any kind of stimulant to, um, with, with your writing, for instance, so in Silicon Valley, back, back to well, acid again, back to our acid. Well, I mean, but for instance, in Silicon Valley, they microdose. Uh, there's cannabis, there's caffeine, there's Red Bull and vodka. <laughs> As we discussed it. earlier, my dear fellow, I've been there, I've done that. I was the hippie's hippie. People would stop me on the street in New York City and ask me if I could sell them drugs. I'm just walking down the street. No, I did it all. I've been there. Uh, I, I decided I'm going to be a writer and anything that distracts from that, I'm not going to do. So no, I mean, I am drinking a cup of tea. Look, I'll show it to you where, since we can see each other on screen. There it is. This there is we my go. stimulant. For Here's my coffee. cup of coffee with some okay. rum in it. Yeah, yeah. I, I jest, no, no rum in there, but a cup yeah, of coffee. It, it truly, Ca caffeine truly, does good for me. Yeah, me too. Truly when I was writing uh, my book about LSD here, Outside Looking In, uh, I was tempted, but I resisted a tripping again because now I'm afraid I'll never come back from it. You know, um, <laughs> in those early days, putting a needle in my arm and doing all of this, I didn't care. I mean, I'm immortal. I'm, I can do anything. I'm, I'm like Superman. I can fly around the world. Now I realize how the fragility is, and my object is to make great art. And I yeah. don't want to mess with that. Do you have any ritual uh, to get started? Do you do anything to prep yourself? Because I think you get up about what, seven? You spend six. a couple of six, six in the morning. Yep. You spend an hour or two just having coffee and warming up a little bit. And then, and then you write. How, how do you do it? What's your method? I get right up, clean up all the mess that my wife has left behind, walk the dog on the beach, read the newspaper, take a nap, get right to work. And so by time, habit. what time are you writing, would you say? Maybe 10 or 11. And how many hours do you go? Oh, as long as it's viable. A couple of hours, maybe. Depending. Of course, when you get near the end of something, you're at work all day and all night because it's so exciting. But what the breed other ritual, and I'm, I... Oh, go ahead. I want to well, know the breed right. of your dog, but but finish this ritual first. Uh, the, the dog is a pulley. The, the dog with the dreadlocks. The ridiculous Hungarian sheepdog. Got gotcha, you. Got gotcha. you. Because my wife's father was part Hungarian. That's why we have such uh -huh. a dog. Uh -huh. uh, 
the only ritual I have, and I recommend this for young beginning writers, is uh, you know there's a lot of voodoo involved in in free form improvisatory writing. So every morning I bleed a chicken in a pan and put my feet in the pan under the desk. And when the blood goes cold, I know I'm done with the day <laughs> of writing. That's about it. I, I love it. You and Manuel Noriega with the chicken blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? Tell me about it. What did he do? Oh, that when they uh, when they when the uh, U.S. Uh, military went down there and 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 got him, the place yeah. he lived, suppose he had a basement where he had, uh, you know, animal blood, and he was doing voodoo type stuff. Of course, wow. that could be government propaganda for all we know. I'm just, uh, but you know, I they like the to story. spin a good yarn too. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I love hearing the story. Of course, it's true. Yes. Yeah. There <laughs> you go. It if true. it's a good story, it's true. <laughs> yeah. I learned that lesson when a friend of mine had a little kid and he said, Michael, tell me a story. And I said, no, his name was Steele. Cool name. And I couldn't think of one at the time. You know, it was late. And I said, you know, Steele, I, I just can't think of one now. He goes, well, can't you just make one up? And that's when it, like the light bulb went on. It's kind of like he doesn't care whether it's real or not. He wants a story. We live for stories. And, and even real stories are embellished, you know, are, are made better. And then our memories of stories, actually, we embellish as we go. Our memory, we 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 adulterate things as we go, because uh, that's what we love. I mean, that's why we love to read and, and uh, why we, we love live movies. For stories, and it's true. And why do we live for stories? Because we live in a meaningless universe. We are pre 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 creatures of great minds and purpose, but there is no purpose. There is nothing. So we need stories to uh, try to interpret what it's like to be alive on planet earth. This is why I'm such an environmental writer. I'm writing about our species in the environment and what comes of it. Uh, who are we? Why are we here? And of course, when I find out, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> well, you know, you, as long as you're talking about uh, eternity or oblivion, um, you, when you're writing, check me on this, Tom, um, you commit a mortal sin, according to writing instructors. You edit as you go when they say you're supposed to just write, let it fly, edit afterward. Did I get that right? You actually edit as you go. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, everybody writes in a different way. Uh, you know, when I'm in the flow and it's going along, usually that's the best writing. But sometimes I have to back up and correct things or rewrite a sentence. Sure. I mean, uh, and and also, by the way, all of my books... Uh, when I turn them in, they're pretty much what you're going to see on the page uh, because I have rewritten everything over and over as I move along. So each day, I'm sure everybody does this, uh, you know, you look at what you did the day before and fool with it for a while and hope that you will get in that state that allows you to move ahead. Sometimes I go backwards and sometimes I move ahead, but stick at it you know, 65 days a year and eventually maybe you might have a book done. Yeah, there, there you go. Uh, now, the uh, reason and then, by the way, do you know my essay, "This Monkey My Back," in which well, you can find it on my webpage, uh, in which I liken this experience of writing and making art to a drug addiction. It is an addiction, and you have this incredible high when you finish a project, especially a novel. It's come, it's right. You see, it's right, and it's just you're in inter. inter interplanetary space you're so excited but then the next day it wears off and you got to do it again and again and again the reason i was so surprised that you edit while you write is that the theory is don't edit while you write let you you can't get to your subconscious mind where all the really great stuff is if you are if you keep hitting the brake just put the accelerator to the metal pedal to the metal you have no break in the vehicle. You have time for that later. It works for you. There's no, and, it, and I was surprised because the, the nature of your writing, your writing is very, as I say, electric, really colorful. This is a guy who's operating from the subconscious mind. Where does your writing come from? Is it, well, I before, mean. Before we answer that, we should invite Jack Kerouac in to give us his view of how you write a novel. You have to drive a car while you're doing it. Well, on the roll, on the roll, on, on the roll, on, on the methamphetamine, you just, just, just type, you just type, and that's it. Exactly. There's yeah. no correcting mind. There's no conscious mind. And again, it is a balance between the conscious and the unconscious mind. I like to say of music, and especially when I was a kid playing saxophone, but more so when I got to, for a brief period, 
sing in this uh, punk blues band. Uh, did your control of your voice, for instance, and of the absorption of what the other guys are doing, uh, is maybe one percent of your consciousness. Ninety nine percent is pure emotion, purely emotive. And I would say with literature, <laughs> it's maybe 10 percent you're conscious of what you're doing. And the 90 percent is the flow of it. So, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, um, but everybody tweaks it in a slightly different way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, whatever works. Uh, that's what they say about, you know, don't trust. There's somebody who said, don't trust any writing advice, even this advice. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So all of these texts on how you write and how this writer writes and whatever, it's complete horseshit because it might be interesting if you love a writer to see what, the, what that writer has to say about the process. Okay, great. But uh, to apply it to yourself is ridiculous because you are an individual and you have to find your own way. I mean, it's you, a curiosity that, that, you know, Saul Bellow writes in this way or I write in this way, but it really doesn't instruct you in any way. You have to find your own method. You got to feel it. Yeah, it's got to be your your way of doing it. Now, you like to hike yes. and, uh, and you walk your dog on the beach. Do you ever record, take a recorder with you and record rather than sit at the, you know, and then transcribe it later the reason I ask that, I've always thought that writing is it's kind of antithetical for a writer to sit in a chair alone and write when we know that the brain stimulating the brain through physical activity uh, promotes creativity. Uh, not, or maybe you have a, just a splendid memory and you think of these things, you come back and you just type them all up. Nope, doesn't work that way for me. I've never considered uh, doing anything. I might take a note once in a while on a scrap of paper, but that's about it. No, I wouldn't want to um, talk into a recorder. Uh, that You'd confuse work. your dog, for one thing. <laughs> well, I have to see the page before me. I have always worked on a keyboard all my life. I've never handwritten anything. I have to see the page and see just what it looks like. Uh, it's an art work in itself, the page. And um, I never consider writing anything unless I'm sitting at my desk totally comfortable my music playing my keyboard in front of me now i might have insights while i'm walking the dog and i just file them away i rarely will stop and scribble something down but once in a while it, it, i do is there any uh thing about uh when you get up from your day of writing do you try to divorce yourself from the writing at that point and just live a different aspect of your life or is it always cogitating even consciously for you? Because some people say you shouldn't even think about the writing where you're going, save it for the time that you're actually uh, on on task. Well, yeah, of course, writing a novel is like uh, having a late term paper. You know, you have it, you worry. It's constant worry. Can you get it done? Can you pull it together? Where is it going? And of course, you're thinking about it on many levels at all times. But I try not to consciously be thinking about it. I'm going to wait till tomorrow morning. I, I finished my work for the day before we started our talk. And I won't look at it again until tomorrow morning. And then I'll look at it and see what it is and putter around with it and hope to move ahead. Um, which of your novels, I know this is a tough question. People tend not to like to answer this, but which of your novels really... Um, came most fully formed or came the the fastest? Hmm. Was there one where you felt like, the, you, I don't know if you have a muse. Would you say you have a muse or not? I don't know. I mean, it's all relative. Uh, was there one novel in particular that just, uh, that was the most fun to write or that just came the most easily? Hmm. I will say that the characters who come most easily to me are the punks like the uh, schizophrenic of the harder they come for instance uh or the, the the guy who narrates greasy lake those characters come most easily to me but um i have made it my mission to try to get the point of view of everybody of every culture everywhere and to write from that point of view the hardest novel i had to write was san miguel so san miguel is is a companion piece to uh, when the killing's done you can't see it from here, but right out there are the Channel Islands. And you can see 
Santa Cruz Island from here that wrote the book about the removal of the invasive species there. But while doing so, I found in my research, I found two manuscripts uh, by women who had lived separately on the other island, San Miguel. They lived there with their families in separate periods as the sole occupants of this island. And their diaries were written in the period in the 1890s and then in the 1930s. And I thought, I would try to write it from the women's point of view in a non-ironic way. My whole approach to life is, is irony and humor. And I almost gave up, but I'm kind of proudest of that novel because it is in that period tone and in the tone of those women, non-comic, straightforward, realistic novel. I didn't know if I could do that. But I think as an artist, you have to always be pushing yourself to do something new. Otherwise, you write the same novel over and over again, like, for instance, um, genre writers. I've never been interested in genre writers, ever, because they're doing the essential thing, is telling a story, but they're not doing it with grace and beauty. And it is the same thing repeated over and over. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I, I just don't know, understand how they don't get bored with that. But um, uh, I'll bet whatever. it's a lot easier. Sometimes I'm jealous of them because... I am starting with a new scenario with every story and every novel to have the same characters and to manipulate them over and over must be very satisfying. That said, I've written a series of stories in the last couple of books. There are now four of them, which I'd like to make into a book of stories like like the uh, like um, uh, up next Beck stories. Uh, and one of them was just in the New Yorker recently, um, and that is fun i'd never done it before so why not try i don't know if i will ever write all of those stories but i they're in my mind uh here's a question that uh, you probably don't want me to ask but what is your greatest strength as a writer is it is it um dialogue is it character development or characterization is it is it a sense of place uh is there one aspect of your writing in particular that you think is is transcendent compared to the to the others obviously you're good at all of it i'm not but yeah. there might be one that's a standout the, the musicality the musicality and the line to line beauty of it is what uh, most uh, interests me um i would say narrative the, the blocks of narrative especially point of view narrative where you're in somebody's third person point of view as in for instance blue skies we're going to talk about blue skies we're in the point of view of somebody, and it's a very, very close third-person point of view, almost like a first-person point of view, but not quite. Um, that sort of narration uh, is what I like best. Some writers write uh, pages and pages of dialogue. I occasionally will write a page of dialogue back and forth, but the dialogue, to me, is secondary to the sweep of the narrative itself and who is narrating. Yeah, you know what? That's a pet peeve of mine myself. If I pick up a book just as just tr trying to, uh, for serendipity, pull it off the shelf, open it up, and I see just tracks and tracks of dialogue, I put it back on the shelf. I like an author who tells the story. Just tell me the story. Don't overquote people. Um, you're going to tell thing. You're going to say it to me better than than uh, your characters are going exactly. to. And, so and it forces a, them to develop once, the character. Once upon a time. Once upon a time. I mean, this is what we want. We want the story. We want a, an overarching narrator, a godlike narrator, a narrator who's controlling this and telling us a story. Yes. You know, I always say if you if you have too much dialogue, at some point the re reader is going to say, who's in charge of the story? It sounds like, I feel like I'm in a room, a cocktail hour, and there's a bunch of voices all over the place, but I know nobody's in control of the room. Mm. But or in control of the story. Too. That could be fun and that could be tremendously interesting as well. It's yeah, more, it's could more be. like a documentary, you know, the camera's running and, uh, or maybe one frenetic chapter out of the book or some, some such thing. Sure. Um, what, when are you most at peace with yourself? When I'm alone in nature. Um, since COVID, I haven't been up on my mountain, uh, but I hope to go back soon. Um, uh, for most of my life, I've been going to a little place in the Sierra Nevada up at 700 feet, rent a house, work there, spend years and years and years of, of, of contacts. But when I'm done with work there, instead of like here, 
uh, I don't have to go and hassle with anything. I just walk into the woods, just walk out in the woods, and I don't think consciously about all of the problems that we are having in our society and in the world, by the way, which I worry about constantly. I'm always, yeah, I hear you. Uh, I'm just like an animal in nature or a child. I'm just seeing, seeing and enjoying. And, you know, I'll go deep in the woods. There are no trails. I'm just, just walking by myself with the dog. And I'll go to my favorite waterfall in July, you know, where there's nobody around. Nobody even knows about it. And I'll bring a book. And I'll sit there and just listen to nature and smell it and see it, maybe dip in the creek a little bit. Uh, uh, sometimes I'll take a nap in the sun with the dog and then walk back home. That's peace. That is peace to be part of nature. I can never understand people who um, uh, they're taking a hike or they're on the beach and they're listening to music at the same time. I would never want to do that. I want to have an experience of nature with its smells and its sights, and its sounds, purely like when we were kids running through the woods. That is when I'm most at peace. Yeah. And number two, of course, is the bar, being at the bar. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what? I'm at peace there, too. <laughs> so when I run into it on Stern's Pier at the bar, mm -hmm. um, and I tell the bartender, hey, that's T.C. Boyle down there. Send him, uh, get him a drink on me. Send him what? What's your drink? I'm a rum drinker. Do you like rum and coke, or do you drink it just rum and neat? diet coke? Diet coke. Rum now, and diet coke. All diet right. coke uh, has its problems. It's made from nuclear waste. You're aware of that, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, but it doesn't rot your teeth. That's right. You know, this is this is why your writing glows. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, uh, many times I've encountered the people who know who I am and so on. It's rarely been unpleasant. It's 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 always nice. It's always nice. Um, and, uh, and I value it. And I very much value having fans and readers. Uh, my Twitter thing, I'm in contact with so many people. And I, I've met some, becomes friends with some of them, actually. It's it's a joy. It's just another way of uh, of connecting. You, you're a Twitter guy. You post on Twitter a lot. I see your postings. And, and your postings are always very, talk about staccato, very short, sharp. Well, um, I never did any social media or took any photographs before the harder they come. The uh, publicist put me on to Twitter. I didn't know what it was. I'd never seen it and know anything about it. But from the beginning, the very first post, I thought, I'm going to make photographs and then make jokes. And so every tw Twitter thing I've ever posted has a photograph or a video that I've made. And the idea of it is, for, for them, is this is your entree into the intimate personal life of a world-renowned novelist who is a schmuck just like you <laughs> <laughs> and i show them everything it's it's corny it's kind it's nice they're nice and it's like when you teach a class and there are certain parameters of comportment uh i'm not censoring anything but everybody seems to behave and by the way i'm not on the main twitter where everybody calls each other an asshole and fuck you and all that we don't have right that. Yeah. We are having Death threats. Of, uh, yeah, we don't have any of that. I'm just in my own little marginal area of it. But that's all I want. And it's all I can handle. I mean, if it were bigger, there's no way I could respond to them. And I want to respond to them. Now, if you were going to associate your writing with a musical genre, which genre would it be? Well, you said it at the outset with jazz improv improvisation. What sub uh, what sub genre would it be? Hmm. You also mentioned John Coltrane, my great and enduring hero. When I was a kid, everybody's telling us about culture and what it means, and I didn't know until I became a devotee of Coltrane when I was trying to play my sax on an alto. He was mainly playing tenor, but I would try to blow along. And I realized at some point, this is great art. That was my first introduction to what great art is. You know, we had Shakespeare in high school. It's great art. But you're told that it's great art. Do you feel it? It's the first thing I felt as a kid that was truly triumphant, uh, out of this world, great art. Acid jazz, I would say. I, I could see you in as uh, Coltrane for sure, but then also does a subgenre, maybe acid jazz. There's not a single good acid jazz station or playlist out there I've been searching. There used to be one years ago on DMX, and now... 
uh, nothing. I think it was DMX. It was it was a cable music uh, channel. Well, if at you any rate, Spotify, I'll bet you could find what you want. I've tried and Pandora, but I, I haven't given up, Tom. Um, you like making public appearances, right? You like you see, you like people. It sounds like you like public appearances, but you like alone time in the woods. You sound it sounds like you really live a balanced life where so. you like your alone time, but you can also be an extrovert when you're around people oh, of love like mind. I just love an audience. It's great, uh, great to, to to do a show and and get the, re the response from the audience. It's it's pretty wonderful. Um, but yeah, I need my private time as well. Do you have a right to, uh, for the moment? In other words, let's say you and your wife go do dinner at a friend's house, and they've got some other friends there who you've never met before. Everybody's a character. Uh, do you ever come back and just write about what you experienced that evening? Um, in other words, just basically turn turn some of the characters into a story, or do they ever integrate into a piece of work you're, that you're you currently have in progress? Rarely, rarely. But all characters that we create are an amalgam of everybody we've ever known. And no, I have never come back from a dinner party and written about that. Although sometimes um, incidents happen that I write about. For instance, let's see, it would be two years ago coming on Memorial Day, my sister-in-law, had an intruder in her house. She was asleep. Uh, the dog started to bark from upstairs. And she was kind of afraid to let the dogs go downstairs. Somebody's in the house. Somebody was flushing the toilet, turning lights on and off, and so on. And uh, when the police came, it was a uh, young woman, maybe in her early 20s, really stoned. And she insisted that she actually lived there. That's why she was yeah. in the house. She had two things with her, a bag of cosmetics and a bag of barbecued ribs. Wow. And that's wow. all that I got from my sister. So I wrote that story. Who is this girl? What is she thinking? And so the New Yorker published it. It'll be in my next book. It's called Princess. I think it was last year they published it. So uh, is that that's the one you're working on now? No, no. That was, it's published in New Yorker already. It's a, just a short story. Princess. Gotcha. Gotcha. What are you working on now? Working on a novel. I'm about two thirds of the way through. Uh, and I, of course, I'm in the suicidal state. At any moment, I could be gone. <laughs> but I'm trying. Is, is that the subject matter? Or you mean no. you're in a suicidal state because you're in the middle of trying to get it all to work? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I get it. I get it. We all do. You know, you have said... I'm going to quote you back to yourself. I'm searching for something. I want to... Uh, I'm searching for something. I want to discover something. Um, I'll just drop that in your lap and can you expound on that? Okay, so the teachers say, write what you know, and that's fine. But what I know is limited. I say, what? Well, write what you don't know and find something out. So I have no problem writing from any point of view, anywhere, any story that interests me. If you look through all my short stories, for instance, you'll see that they have, uh, they're set in any kind of character, any, uh, any culture, any race, any place, Whatever interests me, I'm going to do it. You mentioned the tortilla curtain at the outset. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I'm not Mexican, but why can't I write from a Mexican point of view or any other point of view for that re in that matter? Uh, my, my proudest moment in this regard is uh, in a story called Big Game. I wrote a couple of paragraphs from the point of view of Bessie B, the elephant who's been goaded too many times and just gonna ain't going to take it no more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you a pessimist or an optimist, Tom? Uh, choice A. You're a pessimist. Okay. Are you and and why, read, why is that the case? You've read my books and you can ask that question. Well, but I mean, but that's not who you are. I mean, when I listen to you, when I talk to you, you sound uh, like a guy who fully embraces life, and most pessimists oh, uh, aren't, oh, aren't really I that do, that way. What is the point? I mean, you know, just quoting Jim Morrison this morning: "Nobody gets out of here alive." Really, uh, art is all we have. Art is the way we float above it. But in our essence, all day long, every day, we try to distract ourselves from our mortality. It's there. What is it about? What is the point? Why are we bothering? Uh, yeah, and everything 
always gets worse. Now there are 8 billion people on the earth. And of course, as an environmental writer, I've been writing about this for years. Um, Blue Skies is a companion piece to 2000's A Friend of the Earth, in which I talked about global warming and projected to 2026. Well, we're just about here now. So I wrote Blue Skies as a way of um, examining what, how you and I live now with our consciousness that we have destroyed the environment. We have slaughtered all the other creatures. And it's grim. It's so grim as to what's to come. Eight billion people. All the wars, these horrible wars that are going on, they're essentially wars for resources. That's what's happening. The right wing, the rise of fascism, it's it's us against them. It's build the wall and fuck them, let them die. Why be compassionate? Why be a human being? We're just animals. So yeah. it's um it's yeah. um uh, it's deeply disturbing. It is a reminder that what you just said, that we are animals, that we are about resources, about power, about status. And I think it's E.O. Wilson. You probably read some Edward O. Wilson. And oh, he yes. says he that. He a main, main, main influence on the latest book. Yeah. All the insect stuff in the latest book. Yeah. And I mean, the guy said that, you know, all the evidence we got is that we we can't ever stop fighting, that, that war will never go away. We might get more peaceful along the way. But um, it's not going to go away com completely. We tell it to we, the Ukrainians uh, and the people of the Gaza Strip. Tell it to them. Yeah. Oh, it's horrible. I mean, it's horrible. There's no question about that. What What was the uh, d d uh, stark departure from what we we're <laughs> just talking about? But what was the turning point in your writing life? Was there a point in time where you? had kind of the epiphany that, you know what, I'm good at this. I'm going to be okay at this. I'm going to succeed with this, that when you just knew I, I'm doing the right thing. It was when my first efforts at writing a story, I finally got one published by the North American Review. And that lit me up and that gave me the confidence to apply to Iowa. And by the way, I'd never been to Iowa, I'd never been west of the Hudson River by then. Um, and it's the only place I applied to because so many of my heroes had gone there or taught there. And that kind of ratified for me what I was doing. It was huge. What writer? Um, well, it probably wasn't a singular writer, but um, give us the names of a few writers who were particularly inspiring for you. Yeah, when I started writing as a kid, it was, you know, the 60s, early 70s. And uh, uh, there was a lot of experimentation in music, in culture, and in literature. So Robert Coover, for instance, his first book, Brick Songs and Descants, came to me fully formed of, of uh, the way he would um, work with myths, common myths and common uh, stories that, are, that build our culture, and then cut them into snippets, break them up, and reform them in, in interesting ways. That was what I was trying to do, and it lit me right up, because here it was, perfectly formed. Uh, uh, his colleague, uh, Donald Barthelme, at that time, was big for me, too, as were uh, the uh, Latin American and European writers. So, uh, Gunta Grass, Italo Calvino, uh, in America, John Barth, uh, 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 Garcia Marquez, uh, so many writers who wrote more imaginative, kind of wild stuff, you know, rather than straightforward realism. It took me a long time to come around to feel that I could also write a realistic story as well as these very imaginative wild stories. So I write both now, although I think my heart is more in a story like Are We Not Men, uh, which you were referencing earlier. Uh, just let the imagination fly. Is, but it's also a subject that is reason, uh, uh, you know, uh, for trepidation. Uh, that the technology, what we are capable, will be capable of doing, already capable of doing in some ways, and um, what that implies. And of course, this is why I write such a story. Why I wrote the Relive Box itself. What is gaming? What is online gaming? What does it mean? How does it absorb us? How does it take us out of the actual world? Uh, all of this, I'm not writing it in a sociological way, but there are sociological implications, of course. In the, in the Relive Box, uh, if you haven't got to it yet, read the last story, The Fugitive. The Fugitive, which also the New Yorker had published. It's, um, 
it's a meditation on what happened to us with COVID, but I wrote it before COVID existed. It's about a story I read in the paper. We were searching here for a young man of uh, Mexican descent who was a fugitive. He had to be brought in and locked up. What was his crime? He had tuberculosis, multiple drug resistant tuberculosis. And he stopped taking his drugs and now he was out there, his body, a factory to create super, super uh, uh, strains of this disease. He could kill us all on the planet. What is the legality of that? And the legality, by the way, is you catch him and you lock him up till he's either cured or dead. That's mm. where it all goes. So I wrote that story and it's straightforward, realistic story. And I think it will break your heart. So I have all sorts of uh, methods, I, all sorts of modes of storytelling. I don't reject any of them. If a story mm -hmm. seems to want to work in that way, and we talked about San Miguel, my novel later, later, uh, earlier, um, I'm going to ride with it and see what happens. We've talked about music quite a bit here, uh, Tom, You, but you're a rock and roller too. Who's your favorite, uh, name some of the favorite rock bands or performers you've you've uh, listened to over the years or may, maybe even emulated? Well, the usual suspects, of course. Uh, my, my vocal heroes when I was singing your Bobby Bland, Van Morrison, uh, folks. Robert like Plant. Plant, I love, uh, I love their, their early music. Uh, uh, he was out of my range, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eric Burden is a great singer. People forget mm -hmm. what a great singer he was. Uh, I'm really connected to what's happening now too, and uh, what's inspiriting to me is that a lot of young bands around the world are making. Uh, blues and soul music they're tired of rap and their new way of approaching the world is blues and soul and there's so much great stuff out there um, I got to when I was visiting Potsdam to give a reading last fall fall maybe uh, or spring I <laughs> forget fall last fall um, um, a local radio DJ on NPR, who does a, a new music show up there, had me on the air for a couple of hours. We talked as you and I are talking now, but we also played music. And he has become a good friend who has turned me on to just tons of amazing stuff, including a Chinese band. And I'd love to tell you their name and the name of the tune, except it's only in Chinese characters. <laughs> I have no idea <laughs> what their name is. But they are playing a powerful, great rock and roll um but with us slightly different from what we normally hear in their own cultural way. So there's all sorts of great stuff out there. Uh, the Rock fusion brothers. music with the, uh, with the Chinese characteristics, as they might say. Exactly. Or the Teskey brothers, for instance, the soul, soul, white soul singers from Australia are just stunning. I, it, it, there's just so much great, great rock blues and soul out there, new rock blues and soul. Right, right. There's a great rock jazz fusion band out of Germany called called the Jazz Pistols, and it's just a three man band. It's like ZZ Top with rock jazz fusion, and a uh, German band, no lyrics. They just jam. Really good stuff. The cool. the the Jazz Pistols. I'll look um, them let up. me go ahead. I'll look them up. And what's good about the Spotify is you're reading about the hottest new band in the New Yorker, and you're listening to it at the same time because exactly. you can just go to Spotify. It's so rich an environment now. It's all right there. I mean, it's killed the musician's ability to sell albums, but... Uh, and I'm, I'm part just, of that. I'm guilty. I'm guilty because I uh, I'm not too. listening to the whole album as I used to. Uh, I do. I go through it once or twice, and I pick out the tunes that really kill me, and I put them on my music file. Yeah, I, I do the same. I do the same. So uh, switching gears again here, uh, have you abandon a novel part way through have you started something that you thought I, i've got a beat on this thing and then only to realize you know i i just don't feel any forward momentum anymore i'm dropping it this is very frightening that you should mention it because i'm 200 pages into the new one uh and you're on suicide watch <laughs> of course of course i've never gone that far no uh uh usually within a couple of pages of a short story or a novel i know that that's not working um so I haven't had that experience. I did. I have written a, a, a section of a novel and thought, 
I didn't need it and abandoned it. But that's also rare. Pretty much it's going to work through day by day, moment by moment, in this improvisatory way we were talking about. And it's all a keeper for the most part. You know, one of the things that is really impressive about your career is that you're writing literature, you're writing really creative stuff, but you're also producing so much. I mean, you you come out with a novel every how or, or short story collection every how often would you say oh, if you average it out? Or so. Every, every what? So. 18 months or so. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a fast considering what you it'd be different if you're writing, like you were saying, detective novels or romances or some uh, genre, same characters, basically just a little twist on the last story. Yeah, it's my obsession. It's my obsession. I don't feel right unless I'm actually trying to interpret the world through writing a story. So there's no end to that as far as I can see. Of course, we all grow older and lose our powers. And I, I dread when it should happen but so far i am just proceeding i've taken a lot of your time tom but I've, I've just got a few more questions i want to hit you with um what what is your state of mind while you're writing and i asked this question I, the reason i even developed this question is i remember re reading on writing by stephen king um and he said you got to sit down with a with an attitude you got to approach that screen with an attitude um that's his take on it what's your state of mind while you're writing it's like when somebody is doing a Sudoku or a, a, a crossword puzzle, as my wife does. I'm working on a puzzle, basically. That's my state of mind. And when I forget that I'm working, that's when I'm in the flow. And that is what I live for. If you were to go back in time to a 25-year-old T.C. Boyle, uh, what would you say to him? I'd say lay off the hard drugs. <laughs> so even though you enjoyed them, you would have, uh, if you were doing it all over again, you would not have touched them at all? I don't know if I enjoyed them exactly. I just did what everybody else was doing, you know, mm -hmm. only to a maybe a larger degree because, you know, I was the kind of kid who knew no limits. Um, what would I say to him? Uh, truly... I have no regrets. However, I would have been a better student in high school and undergrad school. I was a real screw up and didn't do what I was supposed to do because I was very busy trying to grow up and live my life as this hip character in the world, you know. Uh, I would have focused much more on going to class and doing the work and learning. I mean, I did it later. It's one of the reasons I went to get my PhD is because I had learned what I should have learned as an undergrad. And I loved it going back. It was it was brilliant for me. I was 25. And I got to Iowa City and did my workshop and immediately started taking the PhD classes. And you know, it was like a month into school. Um, and I'm lying in a field with grasshoppers hopping around, you know, reading Thomas Hardy. <laughs> I thought, wow, this is work. <laughs> let's do a little thought experiment here you're organizing a dinner party you can invite <clears throat> any three people you want living or dead uh whether they're literary musical philosophers politicians um uh, religious figures you name it what three people would you would you want at the table with you well certainly Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun would be the first two <laughs> uh who would pair well with them though I suppose uh, Keith Richards the three of them, <laughs> they'd have a lot in common. That would that would be an interesting pairing right there. Um, let me ask you what you're streaming or watching on, uh, well, Netflix and other streaming channels. Is there any, uh, in the other premium networks? What are you watching these days? Oh, I don't know. There's been so much great stuff. Uh, you know, like have you noticed? Like have you noticed that, that all these different series? Have you noticed how many of them? It's an incredible number that they say based on the novel by, or based on the short story by. And I don't think that that used to be that way. I mean, yeah, they always made movies after novels at times, well, but now you have this- this is good news. This is good exactly. news, my dear fella, because my daughter is developing Blue Skies for a, a TV series. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had some guests here the other day and the woman was just starting to get into dance a little bit. And so I found on the internet a movie that I truly love. 
and it's um, by Carlos Saura called Blood Wedding from the Garcia Lorca. It's only about an hour and it is so magical. You see these people coming into a studio in the, with their street clothes and they take them off and then they're, they're suddenly they're putting on some eye makeup and so on and so on and some costumes. And it's all relaxed and it's just going on. And then they begin, Char starts playing and they begin to dance this flamenco dancing in a completely barren studio. And they show the magic of making art out of nothing. It's brilliant. It's heartbreaking. It's genius. Blood and wedding. What's, what's, Blood what, wedding. Blood Sella. wedding. I think, I think somebody else old. recommended that. Interesting. Oh, it's, it's, it, it, I'm in tears. I've seen it maybe 10 times. I'm in tears. My heart is bursting out of my body. It's, it's just brilliant. Now is uh, Blue Skies is that it's in development? Is it has it been committed to Netflix no. or no 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 we've held it back because of all my books. My daughter, who is a filmmaker with her hubby, uh, this was the one that spoke most to her, and she kind of put her dibs on it, and so we've given her time to develop it. And of course, we had the writers' strike, so that took a big chunk of time. She's awaiting the moment, but I think very soon she will see what kind of deal. And, you know, working through my agent, of course, and see what kind of deal she can get. She's written the script. And I don't know if she's going to try to have her husband direct or what, but she'll be the showrunner and we'll see what comes of it. Fantastic. Congratulations or good luck with that. Well, good well, luck is a better way to phrase yes. it. Because well, there's... You know, thousands of my things have been made into movies or haven't been and on and on and the deals and this guy's in and that guy's out. And I don't pay any attention because you would drive yourself insane. I, yeah. uh, I, which is why I never worked in the film industry. I never wanted to. I just want to write literature and make my own stories and control them in my own way. Um, I love film and I hope more good films are made of my work, but I will never have anything to do with them by way of participation. Yeah. You know, it, it's such a frustrating business. You're pro probably uh, right to steer clear, but I, I knew a screenwriter. He's since passed away, but his name was Bob Comfort. And he had so many things optioned and it just drove him nuts that he got paid very good money for to have him optioned. But in the end, he only had a few movies that were actually made and it's mm. just a constant waiting game. And then you think it's going to happen and some actor drops out and it just blows up on you. I have very close friends who became enormously famous with a couple of TV shows, I'm not gonna mention them, but everybody knows them. Uh, and at some point they could do anything they wanted. And they spent three or four times, they spent an entire year researching and writing and it never came to fruition, never happened. Even for them at the very highest of the highest echelon. But when I sit down on my couch, it's right down there, like right down in that room there. And I've got a book propped on my lap and I'm reading at night. What I'm looking at is my 31 books across the mantelpiece, <laughs> you know? Exactly, that They're you done. have total control over. I have total control, they're done. <laughs> and even if someone makes a movie uh, and maybe the movie is different or I don't like it or the public doesn't like it or they love it or whatever, nonetheless, this is the definitive text, the ones that I wrote. Exactly, exactly. I, you know, uh, it was Francis Ford Coppola. I remember he, him being interviewed. With all his success, he says, I still have to go out and beg for money. He, the yeah. godfather and, and all that. And he still had to go out and beg for money. So he started, he got in the wine business. And he allotted himself 250 a quarter of a million, I think it was a quarter of a million dollars per movie. And he was making art films and much more simple films that he could do for a quarter of a million dollars. And he said, I just, you know, I'm not going to go out begging for money. It's, it's exhausting. It's not, it's not art. And yeah, it's just not something I want to do. My art, all I needed in the beginning was a ream of paper and a typewriter. You know, that's all I need to make. My yeah. Art. Very now inexpensive to be a writer, uh, at least uh, financially, very inexpensive, very taxing mentally and emotionally. <laughs> so the only, there have been several movies of my work and a hundred student movies, but the, the, the big movie was The Road to Wellville, which Alan Parker directed. I loved Alan Parker and I loved what he did. Uh, but I didn't have anything to do with it. I mean, I went to the premiere with him and, you know, and uh, mugged for the cameras, but uh, it happened that I loved what he did. It, was, it had the flavor of the book. It was bizarre. It was like a Fellini film. It was just great. Uh, yeah. 
but I didn't have anything to do with it except to meet him at the when he bought it and have a congressional joint dinner and then to go to the premiere with him. That was it. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Beginning the beginning. And the, I loved and I loved splash. the movie he made also. So yeah, which is pretty rare. <laughs> yeah, I hope there'll be more experiences like that. I don't know. One last question, Tom, and that is how has your writing changed as you have aged and how will it change? as you age or is it forever young do you feel like your your writing has always been in that same vein i'll take choice b uh i don't read reviews because they frustrate me even if they're good but um one blurb that they used on the book uh, from somebody was that the writing of blue skies is very young well, the characters are young. <laughs> you know, one of them is old, but the other characters are young. Well, of course. So that's what I want to do. I want to be the character. So how does it change? It's uh, I think it's the same. Well, what I must say, um, as we talked in this conversation, in the beginning, I was interested in uh, design mainly. Design, action, narrative, and not so much character. But I think I've learned to develop character over the years, too. And to use all modes at my disposal so i think i'm still doing the same thing fantastic tc boyle has been my guest and tom i i've only just begun i'm only four books deep into your 31 book collection and i'm gonna have to read them faster than you're writing them uh <laughs> really enjoyed uh, spending the time with you appreciate it very much and best of luck with your uh with your new project thank you my dear fellow we'll see We'll talk again when it comes out. <laughs>